Josh Spicer from GameWisdom.com, where we examine the art and science of games. Please enjoy listening to this special edition of our ongoing series, The Perceptive Podcast. This is a radio interview I did discussing who I am and about the work that's going into my first book. Good evening, um, listeners to the Game Wisdom. We're doing something very different tonight. We're ter- turning the tables. <laughs> I'm Connie Belay, and I'm the station manager for WRLGLP, uh, which is part of Germantown Community Radio. And we have been very lucky to have Josh Beiser so that we can learn about the very interesting and fascinating world of game development. Um, there's so many people who are really passionate game players. And Josh has a very special uh, affinity for it. He's been into it for a really long time. So I would like tonight to interview him. Hi, Josh. Uh, how are you tonight? Yes, Connie. It's great to be on. This is this is weird for me. Usually I'm the person doing the interviewing. So this is relaxing for me. I wonder why more people don't do it from this side. <laughs> Right. Many people would prefer to be guests than to be hosts. This is I found this out. Um, people think they want to be hosts, and then they discover it's a whole lot of work. So they decide, oh, it's a lot easier to be a guest. Well, tonight, you're in the comfort seat. You're the guest. Yay. And I want to start by talking about how we connected for the radio show. Do you remember back in January how I how I actually got in touch with you or found out about you? Um, yes, oh, through yes. A, a mutual friend, uh, Jacques. He's been a friend of mine for, oh my goodness, at least, I think it's been at least a decade since we first met. This was way before I started doing stuff with Game Wisdom. And uh-huh. you were talking about doing more in terms of like getting my name out there, trying to be more recognized just outside the internet. And he mentioned, of course, you, Connie. And I think we had like a nice lengthy conversation. It was like right around this time. Uh huh. Well, there's the, even a little bit of a backstory before Josh called you and told you about me. <laughs> the way the conversation started was at an art gallery exhibition uh-huh. locally here in Germantown. Jacques Sapriel, I was telling him that we were starting the radio station soon and that I was looking for producers with content who had interesting things to say. And he said, oh, my friend Josh Beiser, he really has a great show. And that's how I said, well, tell him about it, that I'm looking. If he's interested, have him contact me. That's the backstory of how he then had a conversation with you. See, the world is... A network of friendships. The people you know recommend you to good pe- other good people, what I think. It's always about, you know, somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody else, and you just never know at some point, like, where those connections will lead. Exactly. So let's start with some of the things that, we, that I'm sure your listeners would like to know. What was your first experience with a video game? Do you remember back that far? <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, I've, I've. It's my video game knowledge is very weird. I think I've got like a, a mini encyclopedia in my head. There are some games that I remember, like I can just close my eyes. I just remember how I played them back in the day. Um, <laughs> the very first game that I played was. Uh, it was Donkey Kong. No, I'm sorry. It was uh-huh. Duck Hunt and Super Mario Brothers. Way back, uh-huh. the OG there. I think that was 1988 was the first time I played a video game. Oh, wow. I think I might have beat you then. <laughs> Did you have Pac-Man? Oh, I don't think I ever owned Pac-Man, but I've certainly played it many times in the arcades back in the day. Yeah, because Pac-Man was from before they was um, browsers. Mm-hmm. So the games were developed in, um, you know, the sort of character sets, and you could only move them up and across. Mm-hmm. And that's why Pac-Man kind of looks probably the way it does. It was limited in, in the way it moved and it limited in its character sets because it kind of grew out of that world. That's Yeah, yeah. and uh, Donkey Kong back in the day as well, just a single screen, no real uh-huh. scrolling, and... 
It's funny that we're talking about this. I'm sure a lot of the listeners right now, they're probably playing games like a thousand times more powerful and more oh, interesting yeah. than Pac-Man on their smartphone. They're probably playing it like right now as they're listening to us talk. Exactly. So your first experience was like Donkey Kong and, and Duck Hunt. Um, but what were your favorites? I think growing up, I was pretty much like switching on and off between Nintendo and Sega. So I had, I got a chance to play Mario, Mega Man, Sonic. I still remember like that first bit of excitement when I played Super Mario Brothers 3 after watching that movie, The Wizard. That was, (laughs) it was like one part family drama, one part uh, Nintendo propaganda uh, vehicle there. Uh, it, it's funny. Back then, there was little separation between a game and a computer for like serious things like mm-hmm. work. Yeah, my so, uh, my uh, first computer, I didn't get that till about like 1994. So I was like Windows 3.1, DOS, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. I didn't get actual like cable internet until at least I think it was like 2003, 2004. So I was still using dial-up for all that time. And that's wow. how you can uh, date people when you ask them, like, do you remember dial-up? <laughs> if they oh, yeah. just, like, look at you go wondering, what is that? <laughs> how did you get the idea? You know, you, you liked games. How did you get the idea to contact the developers of games? Uh, I think that kind of goes hand in hand with how I started out with doing game wisdom and trying to do more with uh, basically getting involved with the game industry. Oh. I I got out of college back in the mid-thousands, and I realized that from where my um, expertise is, I'm sure we'll talk more about this in a few minutes, but I like to focus more on like the game design side of things. Not so much programming and art, but just like what goes into making a really good video game. Why do people... Uh, play games like Fortnite or right now the new big thing Red Dead Redemption 2 for hours on end. And there really wasn't a lot of information back then. This was like 2007, 2008 when I started a blog for the first time. And while the blog was great, it was still just like its own little thing. And then uh, we fast forward to 2012 when my friend said, I like what you write, but your whole website sucks. Let me build you something better. (laughs) And so we basically just spent like the greater part of 2012 doing a complete design of the site, coming up with the brand, et cetera, et cetera. And then we had this great site, but I realized that just sitting here like ranting about video games all day doesn't really help anybody. Let me see if I can find someone who would like to come on and talk. And we had our very first guest. I think this was like about a month or so after Game Wisdom launch. And I still remember him too. Where I actually did a podcast with him about two weeks ago from when we're recording this. Uh, his name is Chris Park from the indie studio called Arkin Games. And I was just nervous as hell doing that podcast for the very first time. This was like my first time hosting. He was kind of the co-host there. And and I was just like horrible on there. I was like going up, up, up. I was stuttering a lot. And uh, my friend, he was basically kind of leading things. And he even did the audio editing. And then as things went on, it became a lot easier to sit down and talk to someone. And these days is... I basically just say, is there someone I want to talk to? I'm just going to email them, like just right out of the blue and see if they're interested. And how do you get their email addresses from, you know, the back of uh, (laughs) packages or something? (laughs) Or their websites, I guess. Yeah, it really depends on the developers. And that's there's a greater discussion to be had about like good and bad forms of PR on that front. But normally I have to hunt down their email or their PR address through their website. Some developers have like a company that does PR for them or is publishing their game that I kind of go through them as an Mm in-between. And then the other way has just been, I've been really embracing Twitter these last two years, doing a lot more on there, posting, and just basically saying, 
do you want to talk about game design, send me a message. And I've gotten quite a few, a few number of guests that way. Well, I guess it's easier to get directly to people. You can get directly to the president of the United States these days on Twitter, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, a lot of my guests have been like international as well. I've spoken to developers out in India, Ireland, Australia. The only bad thing is that the time difference can be a nightmare. We're talking like an eight to ten hour difference in terms of trying to set up these kinds of casts. At one point, I was trying to do like a roundtable podcast, getting like three or four different developers on. And even like if they were like partially in the same time zone, only like an hour to two difference, it was still a nightmare. So you're free uh, Saturday from three to five, but you're free Sunday from four to seven. And this one's free, you know, tomorrow from like 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. Let's try and get something together. So why did you start doing Game Wisdom? I guess for me, it was because I wanted to know more about game design, not just like programming or art, which at around like 2011, 2012, we were starting to see more colleges embrace that side of the industry. But there was still a very big vacuum when it came to talking about game design itself. And even to this day, a lot of mainstream sites or mainstream coverage doesn't really focus on that kind of development. And it kind of just came out from that. As I spoke to more developers, a common thread I heard was, you know, like, this is like the first time I'm actually talking to someone about game design. And, you know, this is great. Like, why aren't we doing more of this? And it just kind of grew from there. Well, because I guess that when you make the program, what you really have in your head is the design, the logic of the game mm-hmm. and what's going to, you know, go be pass you this way or pass you that way. And that has to do with the grid you've made, the wireframe you've made, the, I guess the, the design, just like playing chess or playing checkers. Mm-hmm. There are two different designs, right? <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, a, I always I equate it to like for like my own interests, like the difference between someone who looks at a car for like the lines or the paint job versus someone who's interested in a car, like how the engine works, how's mm-hmm. the handling, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm the kind of person that says, just let it take me somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I what's well, a gray car, but what kind was it? I don't know. Gray. <laughs> uh, I'm not a great car buyer because of that. <laughs> um so when when did you start your podcast the podcast was like right around again like we started game wisdom so this would have been like october of 2012 so maybe like oh. november or december is when we first started doing podcasting huh. well that, i guess i hadn't thought of it but podcasting isn't really that old although it seems like it was surprising that people didn't come up with the idea of it earlier but it kind of came into its own about that time, I think. People started using it mm-hmm. to sort of archive their ideas and, and uh, you know, take the place of a book in some ways. Mm-hmm. And even with, like, the rise of, like, software, like what we're doing on Skype, um, Google has its own thing, and everybody else is doing more with, like, voice over IP or uh, internet connections like that. It just makes it a lot easier to, like, set up these calls, again, compared to, you know, 80s into the 90s when it was still very much unheard of. Right. Sure. Um, and just think of how expensive it was to make an international phone call. Oh, yes. Uh, and then – you know, digital calls completely revolutionized Skype, basically completely revolutionized that. Mm -hmm. Um, Have you ever done any game development yourself? I've done things on the very small scale. I've written design documents, which pretty much anyone who's ever thought about doing game design for a living has probably a stack of game ideas somewhere, I guess a folder on their computer these days. I've done some... uh, uh, beta testing for a smaller company called Shrapnel Games. This was back in the early thousands. and But really, other than that, it's mainly been more about trying to study and kind of break down what game design is, which is a lot 
which I think can be trickier in some aspects, just in terms of trying to put into words why certain things work and why certain things don't. Huh. So, so when you try to study it, do you make a diagram to help you visualize it? Or... I think for me, like, I'm always just like, like passively thinking about this stuff. Like, I'm the kind of guy who will like sit, sit up late at night, just like thinking about, okay, what was that game that I played? Why did this work? Like, it's just like how my brain's been wired from playing so many video games. And then mm-hmm. kind of going the step further, it really was being able to talk to game developers over the last six years that has mm-hmm. really helped a lot. Because it's one thing to like sit in your sit in your room and just yell about video games or just tell about your thoughts. It's another thing to be able to have like an hour to three hour conversation with someone who is doing it as their livelihood. Mm-hmm. So what what does it take to become a game developer? <laughs> that's a, one of those questions we could that could be its own podcast right there I, we could spend <laughs> the next few hours on that it's definitely changed over the last i guess we could say at this point like 18 years from when the game industry really started to come into its own in the early thousands to kind of where we're at today in today's market, like I give a presentation about how to get in the game industry. The beauty of today is that anyone with a computer now can download software like Unity or Game Maker and so on and so on, and they can try and make their own video game. And there is now enough uh, portals online that you can post it to a store or to just like your own little website and see what comes of it. And... I've had a chance to play some of the most interesting and just diverse games because of how easy it is. But the catch is that it's becoming harder and harder, I think, for someone to make a big living when it comes to the game industry. Because anyone can make a little prototype or put a game up on their site for them and their tent friends. It's another story to actually make something that will not only pay back the cost of developing it, but actually earn you a living. And Mm -hmm. I think that's where a lot of people tend to ignore or just don't understand about the game industry. (laughs) I've spoken to developers who have been doing this for like 14 plus years, and it can be an industry of ups and downs. And... Mm -hmm. For every game that gets covered, there's probably a few dozen games that just disappear, and that developer is left with a bill that they may not be able to pay back because nobody is buying their game. And I think one of the big things, I mentioned this a few minutes ago, is that PR and being able to put yourself out there is such a big part of trying to run a game company. When you asked me earlier about how I get in touch with game developers, some of them... It's easy to get in touch with them. I can send them a message on Twitter. I can send them a link. It's like right on their website and we're good. Other times it's like I'm on a scavenger hunt trying to find out exactly where the email is. Like it's like hidden in like the back corner, like three pages into their website. Or they never get in touch with you. Like you send them an email and they just blow you off. And it's like, well, what, what am I, how is this person, uh, you know, dealing with press if they're not answering their emails. <laughs> well, I, uh, you found that it was correlating to whether or not they were um, having a successful uh, company? I hate to say this, and and I'm sure somebody's listening will probably send me something nasty <laughs> when I say this, but I, I think it is. Like, I've noticed that the developers who either don't get in touch with me or just flat out, or they may get in touch and then refuse to like do anything else there. Their games tend to just kind of come out and then they die with a whimper. Like some of the best, the developers I've had a chance to spoke to who've had really big successes, they are all over the place in social media. They have, you know, Facebook groups, Twitter account for everything. They're constantly talking about their game or doing stuff like that. They're going to conventions. They're, you know, they're the kind of people that if you ask them, you w- would you like to talk? They can't, you know, you can't keep them away. They want to get on and talk to you about their game. <laughs> wow. So advertising and promotion works, huh? 
I would say it does. And the sad part is that for the developers I've spoken to who have made it big, I've seen developers who don't do anything. And then they're left, you know, scratching their head going, I just worked on this game for two years and nobody's buying it. And mm-hmm. that's kind of the scary realization. I've spoken to developers who've had copies sold in the thousands. And I've mm-hmm. spoken to a few developers who've had their games sold like 10 to 15 copies. And that's it. Mm-hmm. And it can get, it's, it can be very stressful when you get that situation. Right. Well, how do they, how do you think they get into deciding they want to do game design? I mean, are they, did they go and you know, were they programmers first and then decided to do game design or? Um, um, I would say I that that it. kind of route has certainly changed in the last like 20 to 30 years. For mm-hmm. many people who started, like we're talking 80s or even older than that, into the 70s with companies like Atari and television, etc., they got in as a programmer. They went to school or college to do programming, and then game design kind of evolved from that. And that's what I was talking about when I went to college back in the mid-thousands. There were still no real game design courses. You had technical schools like DigiPen or Full Sail, but those places were limited, and they were, of course, very expensive. Most colleges just had nothing. You would go for like a programming and then that would kind of be like your entry point. Then you would do studies on your own to do game mm-hmm. design. Mm-hmm. Now, today, I think it, we're seeing, a, again, thanks to how easy it's been getting to get into the game industry, we're seeing people in almost all walks of life go into game design and into the game industry. I've spoken to developers who they start out in like accounting or law, and then they decide to become programmers or start making their own game. And then there are people who did go to school. They had, they did the whole college experience at a college like DigiPen or Full Sail, and then they decide to try and do something else with that. But it just really has become like, like anywhere at any time, as long as you have a computer and internet connection, you can try to make a video game. Wow! So your your book is, I guess the uh, the the listener doesn't know yet, <laughs> so I'm going to say it. It's Josh's first book is will soon be on the market. When is the actual release date, Josh? It will be and November. Tell everyone. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, it will be November 12th of this year, and the title is 20 Essential Games to Study. Okay. So now tell us how you picked those 20 essential games. <laughs> oh, that was a fun part. I started, like, the whole story of the book is very interesting. People for, like, the last three, four years have been telling me, Josh, you talk about video games all the time. Why don't you just write a book about it? And I was like, yeah, I guess so, but it just seems like a lot of work. And then finally, like, enough uh, people yelling at me convinced me, okay, I'm just going to make, like, a little tiny book, you know, nothing too fancy, you know, like a, you know, like a five to 10,000 word uh, ebook. And so we were coming up with various themes, various concepts, and we originally settled on, you know, let's just make it, like, five to 10 games, you know, 10 interesting games that, you know, you would be interested in looking at. And then as of this was, ooh, I think this was like May or April, I got an email from a person who works at a major publisher, CRC Press. They do um, college books, technical books, medical books, a lot of stuff like that. And he was like, hey, you know, you, you do a lot of writing on sites and such. Have you ever thought about writing a book? And I'm like, well, yes, I'm kind of writing something right now. And so I pitched it to him. And he was like, wow, this is great. But how about you do something a little bit bigger? Like, like what? And he said, maybe you could do like 20 games and you can, you know, make it a lot bigger. I'm like, okay. And then all of a sudden, this tiny little book turned into, I think right now it's just just over 25,000 words of just being able to look at 20 games that basically I looked at all the games that I've played over the last 30 years to try and find titles that either 
were recognized, but not for, like, their gameplay. One of the, I guess I can spoil it here, one of the games I mentioned was Metal Gear Solid, way back, the very first major game Hio Kojima did. And while that game has certainly been celebrated, I want to talk more about why people embrace that kind of gameplay. And, like, for myself, it all came down to what did these 20 games do differently? when it came to game design. What attracted people to playing them or still playing them to this day? And I tried to also ignore a lot of the well-known titles. Like, Mario is not in this book. There is no mention of a Mario game anywhere here. Because that would have been easy. It would have been... Like, everybody knows who Mario is. Right. But some of the games I mention are either cult classics in their own right, or games that most people may never have even heard of, let alone even seen footage of. But you pick them because... Um, basically about why this kind of game design stands out. Like, if you're uh-huh. looking to learn something unique about game design, th- these are games that you should look at and to kind of take mm-hmm. notes on what developers did to push something that you normally don't see. Why... A certain game does really amazing work in the roguelike genre, or why a game continues to be considered like one of the top 100 games of all time. And it's not just because a lot of people played it, it's because it did something that nobody else has seen before, and in several cases in the book, nobody has ever seen after. Mm, That's interesting. Mm-hmm. So the real what they would call unicorns, I guess, in, yeah. the, uh, in <laughs> the business world. Oh so yes. So what? What? So do you look for that quality in a game that it's different from anything else, or do you look for something else? I think for myself, it comes down to like two things. I always talk about how unique a game is and how refined it is. Unique, of course, meaning as you just said, is it something that I've never played before? And that's always a very weird concept, especially today. I mean, at this point, I have probably have played several thousand video games in my spare time. A uh, friend of mine told me that there is a study going around that says that most people only buy four games a year. And I told him, I play four games a week at this point. Like, that <laughs> is no longer relevant to me. But with all the games that I've played... I need, I want to find something that I haven't seen before, or even something that I may have played something like this, but the game puts its own unique spin on it. And then on the other side, when it comes to refinement, is this something that I can get into and enjoy? Like going back to the uh, car analogy from a few minutes ago, it's kind of like saying, yes, this car may have a great paint job, but the thing I turn on the car, the engine, you know, shoots out of the uh, front there. It was like, (laughs) what was the point of that? And I've played amazing games that were very rough, just as I've played very polished games, but it's the same exact thing that I've played many times over. Like, right now, a lot of people are talking about the franchise Assassin's Creed that just had... I don't even know how many games are up to at this point. I've lost count. But, it, like, that kind of style to me, like, I just don't have any interest in it because I've played that same game day in and day out with the other iterations. Uh-huh. It's the same thing that goes with Call of Duty, which... I don't know, you may get angry listeners from me bad-mouthing uh, Call of Duty there, but like that franchise just doesn't interest me anymore because I've seen it, I've played it, and I want to do something else. Uh-huh. Well, my biggest exposure to video games is through you know young people that I'm around <laughs> <laughs> because they, I didn't really grow up with them, so it was something I counted as an adult. And to me, I have to say that a lot of games seem quite similar to me. Mm-hmm. You know, you you run around, you jump up on stuff, and you jump down stuff, and then you try to shoot people. And then somebody else comes up and tries to shoot you. By the way, I always lose. I can play with a seven-year-old. I always lose because I go like, where did that person come from? Where did he come from? <laughs> How do I aim this? Which, which thing do I push to go forward? How do I jump? <laughs> so, I mean, I, they love to play with me because they'll always win. Come on, play with me. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten out of the Fortnite game because of that. I have... 
I, I'm leaving that to everybody else to enjoy. <laughs> right. Do you know that in the New York Times today, there was a very large article about how in Silicon Valley, developers are not letting their children get near screens or video games mm. or electronics. No, I did not hear about that, but yeah, there's always been that discussions about uh, the healthy behavior when it comes to video games, and it's probably not going to go away anytime soon. I've spoken to a few people who are psychologists who study video games and about the impact that it has, and I know it's becoming more and more of a concern, especially with all the free-to-play games that are being released, people who are getting hooked on stuff like Candy Crush, Angry Birds, and again, like those kinds of games that are just explicitly designed to target people to get them to spend money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've spoken to a friend of mine. His name is Ramin Shogazard. He's a, a video game economist. He was one of the first people to do research into uh, social gaming, massively multiplayer online games, addiction, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And he has written multiple papers and articles about kind of the impact video games have on the brain, especially when it comes to the pleasure center of the brain. And how, as you said, many video games, especially from like AAA developers or companies, they are designed down to what font color they use to try and entice people to keep playing, to use mm-hmm. all those little psychological tricks to present a product that may not be all that healthy or all that enriching, but it can certainly earn lots of money in the short run. Right. That is the point of advertising and Mm -hmm. manipulation is like, so I make money. (laughs) Yeah. Um, What are game developers like, though, since they've um, probably been exposed to games all their life? Do you you find that there's a personality type that's that's common? I think that's a really good question. It's, again, like with everyone having different walks of how they got in the game industry, we've definitely, I've had a chance to talk to a very wide margin of people there are some people i've spoken to who may fit like the quote-unquote the stereotypical programmer the person who you know sits in front of their computer they just rarely say something and when they do it's very direct and to the point then i've spoken to people who are some of the most outward people you could ever imagine they will if i ask them a question they'll give me like a 50 minute to an hour long answer per question (laughs) <laughs> well, that's also inappropriate, socially inappropriate. <laughs> mm-hmm. <Yeah. laughs> it's like you're not reading the cue that the other guy has to like go to the bathroom or something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you're still talking. <laughs> yeah, and it's very interesting talking to people. Like I've had a chance to talk to people who are veterans, like five to ten years plus in the game industry, and people who just started, maybe like a year to even less from when they got in to talking to me. And it's always fascinating to hear, like, their thoughts on the industry or even just how they come off. Some of, like, my best guests have been people who you can tell, I'm sure, since you've done so much work in radio, Connie, that you know, like, when a really good conversation is happening. When it's not just one person saying, the you know, talking for 50 minutes to an hour. There's that really good back and forth between them. And when we get those on the podcast, that's like a, we basically have to force ourselves to stop talking or we'll just be there for like five to six hours. Right. Yeah. That's when you're both talking and listening. Yes. <laughs> Isn't it? It's like the, the give and take of, of an interaction. Mm-hmm. So, so some game, some developers do have multiple different, uh, multiple personalities of, some people are very outgoing, and some people are sort of the classic, uh, or, you know, autistic person. Because mm-hmm. you, you think, you know, really doesn't like to deal with people, just likes to be on their own, and likes to deal with just things. Yeah, um, I've spoken to a few developers. I won't name well, names about it, but uh, I've spoken to a few people who you can tell, again, like even like as listeners, you can tell when the conversation is just not working, where one person's mm-hmm. going, yeah, so how are you doing with this, this, and this? And the other person's like, yeah, I'm fine. And that's all <laughs> they say about it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, stereotypes do 
come from somewhere. Um, and sometimes we, you know, we enhance them. I have to tell you that um, it, as part of my career in instructional design, you know, we do a lot of multimedia in instruction, you know, when you're using computer-based stuff. Yeah. And um, I remember years ago when Microsoft came out with their first sort of instructional design software, it was, it was pretty rough around the edges. It wasn't easy to use. It required knowing a lot of coding to use it. And I went to their convention, and it was in the New York Hilton. I remember opening the door, and there was just this sea of people who were very much alike. Mm-hmm. They were all about 30 years old. <laughs> they were all male, and they were all dressed in casual sloppy clothing. <laughs> and I said, <laughs> and of course they're going to have cold pizza. For, oh, oh. You know? And then, but what really made me know that they were very similar in outlook is that the guy at the front of the room, and remember this is a big hall, he was projecting pages of code onto a projector and you couldn't see it. It was way too little up there, but he, so he'd handed it out to everybody. You know, everyone had gotten like, like 10 pages of code to look at. I said, Oh, this is a really fascinating kind of conference. <laughs> and the, the joke was that he had collated them in the, in the wrong order. So the real challenge was for people to figure out <laughs> that, how the, the code was that he was talking about and how it related to what was in their hand. It was pretty funny. But none of them were upset about it. None of them thought like, this guy is an idiot. What is he doing? <laughs> Why is he making this so hard? I paid money to come to this conference. No, instead, they were just happily, you know, like dealing with the challenge. And I said, uh-huh, well, that must say something about People who develop, you know, well, they, in a sense, they're games. They're, you know, uh, multimedia things. Mm-hmm. There must be some commonality there. People like to solve problems and, and don't get thrown off when somebody just hands them a problem that would just frustrate somebody else and say, well, it's not worth my time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it was worth their time. We just want to figure it out. Yeah, and we've seen, I think, as one of the more interesting aspects of kind of like the social side of game development has been like the rise of uh, social media platforms, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And now mm-hmm. these people who may be like a very quiet, introverted person, they're now on a platform where they can type something and now tens of thousands, if not millions of people are going to read every single word they are going to say. And mm-hmm. Like, from my own side, as like someone who follows a lot of game coverage, I have seen developers just horribly, you know, cut themselves at the kneecaps, you know, saying mm-hmm. something on Twitter or on Facebook that gets completely out of control for them. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, I'm sorry, from the very first time I was on the Internet many years ago, I said, this is not a good place to be. I have no interest in being on social media, none whatsoever, <laughs> because of the people who are out there thinking that it's OK to say things you would never say to a person in, in, to their face. So, of course, what's happened is that the culture has now let people say those things to people to their face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. it's devolved from being trolls to, um, you know, the assassins. I guess like it, it became okay online, and then they kind of step out of line and think that this coarseness of, you know, not seeing people as human mm-hmm. um, or not seeing, not identifying with them is, you know, it's okay to say these really mean, terrible things to people because they can't do anything to you, you know. Oh, yeah, and we see that on YouTube as well these days with so many different channels and videos being made. Like from my own perspective with the game industry, I see people put up videos like just like attacking game developers, saying all nasty things about them. And again, go, I think it goes back to that freedom, but also that a lot of people just really don't understand video games at more than just the surface layer. Like I've seen people make videos saying, oh, game developers are lazy. They're, you know, trying to steal money <laughs> and stuff like that. I'm just sitting there going, 
no, that, that's not right. And it's mm-hmm. just very hard to, I think, really separate, you know, quality discussions from, you know, the rants and the ravings that are going on on social media. Wow. I guess it's kind of like people, you know, some people really love to do um, crossword puzzles. They like really hard ones. They like it for the challenge. They like it for, you know, the, the sense of accomplishment when you when all the pieces come together and you, oh, yeah, now they all make sense. Um, and I've always thought of, you know, game development kind of like that. It's like the completion of a puzzle. It's like the satisfaction of getting all the pieces together and then they all work. Mm-hmm. Um, and, they, yeah. and they do what you wanted it to do. <laughs> I think for most developers, I don't think it ever turns out exactly how they have it planned. And that's <laughs> that's the uh, nightmare and the beauty of game design. That no uh, plan survives first contact, I guess, as the saying goes. I mm-hmm. remember uh, talking to a game developer. This was like three, four years ago. And he said something really good that kind of stuck with me. That game development is combining entertainment with programming. Two very hard things to do on their own that mm-hmm. can become just an impossible mess of elements when you put it together. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes it comes out charming. Like, the, the best thing about Fortnite is, you know, is the dances. <laughs> <laughs> it really, to me, anyway... I was um, in front of Reading Terminal Market in Philadelphia, which is, um, you know, a food market, and it's very famous in this big tourist attraction. And there was a trio of um, older black musicians playing sort of R&B, sort of old old school Mm R&B. And a little, and a mother with a child in in a stroller was coming by, and the kid was maybe five years old or four years old. They were Chinese. The kid jumps out of the stroller, runs up in front of the musicians, and he starts doing Fortnite dances. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, wow, the cultural mix here is just amazing. Yes. A four-year-old Chinese kid going doing Fortnite dances to R&B. <laughs> But, you know, I recognize it. And if, and if I want to get a rise out of uh, my grandson, I'll tell him I'll do the dab. I said, ah, I'll do the dab. No, don't do that. <laughs> but to me, that's the most charming thing. But it is. It's a comment. How did that get in there? You know, they decided to have these guys chase people around and then stop and do a dance. <laughs> but. To me, that's one of the nicer things about that game. But other than that, to me, it's, it's exhausting. Oh, to yeah. Oh. Always running. Mm-hmm. <laughs> always running after something to blow up something. <laughs> uh, I, I guess I like puzzles more than I like games. Uh, where, you build, uh, where you build the puzzle, whatever, you put it together, and then at the end it's like, ah, okay, it's finished. <laughs> Have you ever played Minecraft? Um, Yeah. Uh, badly, we play badly. That's the one where I ne- can never tell that somebody's a creeper is coming up behind me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Can't you see the creeper is coming up? Where, where, where? <laughs> <laughs> That's me. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm the best person to play with because I always lose. Um, but yeah, Minecraft builds things, but they're so temporary. You just build them and smash them down. It's not like you build them and then it's perfect and then it's done, you know. Mm-hmm. It's just always a process. It's just never end. It's exhausting. It's just like yeah. always, 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 and go and go and go. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. For like me, like those kinds of games, like I like to play them in the short run, but then I just get very tired of it. You know, going okay, I can build you know my fifteenth castle or my twentieth mansion somewhere. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, and I, I realize that you know when they get into it, they get into you know getting the the treasure chest and getting the little things, you know, that you get more of and then you lose lives and you gain lives and, <laughs> and you're always looking at the score. Um, but mostly to me, it's they just keep running and building and smashing and running and building and smashing. <laughs> oh, yes. are, are there any games that are sort of like what I described about sort of puzzles where you put something together and then it's, done if you get all the things right you sort of make a perfection and then you know then you start all over again with another one 
Hmm. There's been quite a few puzzle games. Like this has always been the beauty of the independent game scene of games that come from smaller developers, sometimes as small as just literally one person who made the entire game themselves. Mm -hmm. And the diversity there is amazing. I'm trying to think of some really good puzzle games. There is a developer I follow. His name is Zach Barth. He has a company called Zachtronics. All his basically MO are puzzles that are mm -hmm. either like a programming based puzzle or like a logistics puzzle. And the beauty is that there is no set solution. It's basically here's a start point. Here's an end point. Everything else in the middle is in flux. You just do what you want. Like as long as it satisfies the end condition, you can move on. Sure. But then you can uh, look at your solutions. You can compare to your friends or other people. And I just always love playing those games where I spend like an hour and a half. I come with this great solution, and then I see I'm like thirtieth down among all my friends. I'm like, <laughs> oh, they're all cheaters. They they didn't solve. This. They just probably just cheated this whole time. <laughs> Have you met many developers in person, like at conferences, or mostly you talk to them? It has been mostly through the internet. Thanks to Skype and other programs, we've had face-to-face -face talks like that. But I have been kind of limited in terms of getting out to conferences. Just um, I have a, a bad right leg from like surgeries when I was younger, so I can't really drive around. Uh -huh. Uber has been, you know, a godsend for me at least on that front. Oh, cool. Um, I went to my first actual like video game conference, like just like for the fans this past, I think it was June or July. There is a GameworkCon festival that was like literally like six minutes away from my house, like a hotel here. Mm -hmm. And I got to meet a developer behind some of like the old uh, games like Rampage. Mm -hmm. um, I forget some of his other titles, but Rampage is probably the most well known. I even met the guy who did the voice of Duke Nukem. That a very famous first person <laughs> shooter from the mid 90s. And um, I did go, the one major conference I did go to, this was back in 2012, was the Game Developers Conference. That's out in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like the biggie when it comes to developers. It's all about uh, networking, it's all about talking about design, building video games, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And if I ever get the money again saved up, I would love to go back out there and meet more people in person. Hmm. Wow. Well, that's one of the things that's intrigued me is that it seems that a lot of games lead to, you know, like being cut off from people. So more recently, some of these games that the children played, like Fortnite, they, they're on the telephone actually with their friends. So they're actually talking. It's more social. They are talking and having fun with friends and they're playing the games at the same time. So I think that's um, that's kind of a newer development. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah, the social side of video games has definitely been, I think, one of the more um, underappreciated parts of how video games have really grown over the last, I would say at this point, like, again, like 18 years. Mm -hmm. like, again, I remember playing video games, you know, by myself in my little room back on like the Nintendo and Super Nintendo. I mean, today I can go online and talk to people literally all around the world about playing these video games. I've met a lot of friends. I mean, the, going back to the origin of Game Wisdom, the person who designed my website, we met playing video games back in 2011. Mm -hmm. And... And it turns out like it's like the craziest thing. He actually lives like right in Pennsylvania and he lives in like northern PA. <laughs> and like we never knew of that until, you know, we started talking for real. <laughs> it's amazing what real talking can do. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads me to something. We I had um funny experience with my with my little grandson. We were um out driving along and uh he wanted to get a video game. And I passed a place that I looked like a game store. So we parked the car and I got out and I walked in. And the minute I opened the door, I realized, no, <laughs> this is not GameStop. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, there were these older men sitting around tables. It was sort of like the old Dungeons and Dragons. Mm -hmm. They were playing with game pieces. They were playing like board games. Mm -hmm. And clearly it was like a club. Um, 
but it definitely was gaming and I'm sure it was interesting, but everybody was like quiet and <laughs> older and I, a 10 year old just was not going to fit in with that crowd. <laughs> yeah, and, the and, the, and, the, and the pieces were very beautiful and elaborate. They would cost a fortune. They sold them there. That was what oh, they did. Yeah, the tabletop market is one that I've never really had like too much involvement in. Like tabletop and board games, that's its own unique microcosm when it comes mm -hmm. to the game industry or just games in general. And yeah, that stuff can get expensive. Um, they're, the big name one is the uh, Warhammer Universe by Games Workshop, and they sell like packs, like usually like a hundred to two hundred dollars per pack mm -hmm. of their stuff. Um, yep. I remember looking it up, and I went, "Yeah, I would never be able to afford this. I'm having enough time buying video games to look at for this site. I can't yeah. throw down like four hundred dollars to get little figurines, and then they <laughs> sell the, their own paints and paintbrushes as well to use." Right. Well, we stumbled into one of those places, and I said, okay, honey, let's back out slowly. <laughs> <laughs> Just back out slowly. <laughs> These guys should have looked up and sort of stared at us like, what are you doing in here? <laughs> back out slowly. Um, but there are a lot of places that people can try out games with, without buying them. I mean, because now I notice that the, um, you know Target, every place has a kiosk where you can stick the game in and, and like, try it out or see it anyway. Mm -hmm. And then I guess yeah. that's different. It doesn't have to be sight unseen. Yeah. And we're seeing a oh. lot more in terms of trying to get more people to try out these games. I know mobile has been really great on that from, you can just literally download whatever app you want and then try the game. And then if you like it, you keep it. If you don't, you know, it's a swipe away from being, you know, tossed away, never to be seen again. Huh. And that's mobile. Yeah, like smartphones, stuff like that. Oh, oh, I, I, mean, I thought you were saying mobile, like the name of a company. <laughs> I, I know a toy company named Mobile, M O B I L. Uh, I thought, oh, maybe they went into gaming. <laughs> How would I know? <laughs> oh, you mean mobile, like on your phone, just as yeah. a generic type, huh? Mm -hmm. yeah, well, like the big, um, I was just going to say the big one that kind of took over like a little bit for last year is that Pokemon Go. I think we were oh. talking about that when we had our fir first phone call as well. Like yeah. it was the big thing and then it kind of like disappeared. And now I'm not sure where it's at at the moment in terms of how much people are playing it. Oh, it's ready for another big resurgence. I have to tell you that in my wallet right now as we speak is an advanced purchase of the next Pokemon Go thing that's coming out in uh -huh. on November 16th. Same day as your book, I think. Oh, wow. Um, and I had to pre-buy it so that he'll have it, you know, the instant <laughs> it comes out. <laughs> of I'll course. download the code and send him the code, and then he can download it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, at, Pokemon has not gone away. We were driving down the street the other day, and um, he saw some you know, he had his Pokemon Go out because we were stopping, driving past places where he could get points. Mm -hmm. And he saw three people and said, they're playing it. They're playing Pokemon Go. So we stopped the car and went over. And sure enough, they were. They were playing Pokemon Go too because they were in a spot where there were a lot of, you know, big creatures to capture, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. 10 o'clock at night, I'm standing in the middle of a field down in <laughs> Mount Airy because there were a lot of Pokemon Go things to get. I said, it's getting cold out here, honey. Can, I hope, can you get all of your creatures faster? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of really glad that that didn't come out when I was younger. Like I, I dodged that bullet of just like walking around my neighborhood looking for Pokemon. <laughs> well, each, each, at least they get out and walk. I said, yeah. you know, they, they combine exercise with. <laughs> uh, well. <clears throat> Is there anything else that you'd want to tell us about, you know, your life in gaming um, before we kind of wrap up? Sure. I, as of this time as recording, I just pitched a second book series to my publisher mm -hmm. and I'm waiting to hear confirmation. But if it goes forward, I may have a multi book series to be developing over the next year or so. Holy moly. That's yeah, fantastic. Yeah, the, the idea is to do a, a deep uh, design dive on an individual game system or a mechanic. 
Like the first one is, well, as we were talking about with Fortnite, it's all about jumping, kind of the history of how jumps started back in, you know, Pitfall, Harry, and Mario to where it's at today in the AAA and independent space. Huh. You're right. There was a whole jumping culture. Mm-hmm. Hmm. And for myself, as with my uh, leg, I won't be doing too much of that in real life. I'm afraid that for anyone listening, you won't be seeing me doing any Fortnite dancing as well. <laughs> you do the dab, though. It's just all, it's all on. <laughs> <laughs> you do the dab. Uh, well, I, I'm really so thrilled. Again, your book is 20 um, games that – say it again. 20 games you should uh, know. No, really 20, want to know? Sure. It is 20 essential <laughs> games to study. Okay. 20 is said. 20 Video Games to Study, 20 Essential Video Games to Study mm-hmm. by Josh Beiser. Mm-hmm. And it's coming out in two weeks, I guess. Yep, November 12th. November 12th. Oh, I'm sorry, but the 16th is Pokemon. You're the uh, maybe that's okay. why they moved it up. They didn't want, yeah, that's right. they didn't want the competition. <laughs> yes. Wow. Well, we're thrilled, um, Josh, to hear that news and even more thrilled about possible series going on um mm-hmm. we just are really lucky to have your show um yeah. i know we enjoy it and it's it's different it's not you know I'm, I'm i'm glad to have something that for uh you know a whole segment of audience that you know something different from like a science show or the yeah. environmental show but you know yeah. it's the fun show too <laughs> yeah and uh, one last thing i almost forgot i've been doing presentations as well i go to some of my local libraries and i give little lectures about game design industry topics as well and i'm always looking for new places to come out and speak to okay well I, listeners out there josh Beiser. um just you can reach him, Josh, on your um, your email is Josh Beiser at Game Wisdom. Uh, 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 Josh um, at Game Hyphen Wisdom dot com. Okay. Or you can message me on Twitter at G W Beiser. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you so much for spending an hour talking uh, with me, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to turn the tables and uh, interview the interviewer. Um, I hope I did half as good a job as you always do with um, <laughs> drawing out um, information and, you know, camaraderie with developers. And uh, thank you so much. And I hope to talk to you again. Some, uh, well, next week we'll have your regular show. We'll be back on the air. And yeah, if you'd like to have me back on, I, this is relaxing for me. I can uh, sit here and talk for another few hours if you would like. <laughs> <laughs> well, take care. I, I don't think of myself as a great interviewer. You do a much better job. <laughs> <laughs> All so, right. Take take care, Dad. Bye-bye. All right. You too, Connie. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Once again, this has been Josh Beiser from GameWisdom.com. Tune in next time for another discussion about the art and craft of game design right here on the Perceptive Podcast. WRLGLP is a project of the Germantown Life Enrichment Center a nonprofit founded in 1871 to support community health, education, and well-being, and still located in the historic YMCA of Germantown building at 5722 Green Street, with a heated pool, courts, fitness center, steam and sauna, summer camp, and after-school programs offered at modest fees for all to enjoy. (music) 